Hello, and welcome to the Scottish History Podcast. My name is Sarah, and you probably have noticed that I am a new voice on this show. So to start, I'm just going to tell you a little bit about myself, uh, and then we'll hop into today's topic, which is Viking food. Yum. (laughs) Okay, so um, my interest in British history started pretty much when I was a kid. I got a book of Arthurian legend from my godmother, and it just sort of spiraled out of control from there. Um, Since that time, I have completed a couple of degrees. I've got a bachelor in British history from the University of Georgia, my home state. I have a master's of science in museum studies from the University of Glasgow, and most recently I have a an M. Lit in Viking archaeology, also from the University of Glasgow. So I'd like to think that my interests are varied, um, but at the moment I'm really honing in on this Viking and late Norse presence in Britain, and specifically Scotland. Um, So that's probably going to dictate a lot of the content of my episodes, uh, especially this one today which, as I said, mentioned before, is going to be Viking food. Now, because I've done both history and archaeology, I have sort of a unique perspective on the past, especially the early medieval period, and cultures such as the Vikings who didn't keep written records of themselves. Um, In these periods, these sort of undefined Uh, time periods, you really have to rely on the written records of other cultures in addition to the archaeological evidence to sort of piece together a bigger picture of what was going on and what these people were like. I think that's part of the reason I'm so interested in this period, especially in Britain, because uh, you have so many different players. Peter and Chris covered this Uh, time period in an earlier episode about, you know, sort of the making of the Kingdom of Scotland. And they talked about all the different groups that were extant and active in Scotland during this early medieval period. It's a really great episode, and I highly recommend that if you haven't heard it already, you go back and listen, because it'll provide you with some good background for what I'm talking about today, which will be honing in on one of these groups, the Vikings, Uh, and really taking a closer in-depth look at what their day-to-day lives would have been like through looking at food. This brings me to another really interesting topic, for me at least, which is food archaeology. And this is, I would say, a relatively new field, or at least a newly expanding field, through which people use food and examine food to take a closer look at cultures. Um, Now, these aren't always prehistoric cultures, and the food isn't always excavated through archaeological methods the way I will be talking about today. Um, But it's a really neat way of getting a more in-depth look at peoples of the past. And I think a very interesting way to relate to peoples of the past, because... Food is one of those things that we all have in common, all human beings. Uh, And to look at what it is that people ate can really help us relate to them more and to bring them further into the realm of reality and, you know, less of a distant sort of idea. So... Today I'll be combining all of my loves, history, archaeology, and food, uh, in order to sort of bring you closer, hopefully, to the Vikings of early medieval Scotland. Over the last 30 years, advancements in excavation techniques and scientific analysis have allowed archaeologists a previously unknown understanding of the paleo-environmental economy of Viking and late Norse periods across the North Atlantic. Um, Prior to this, most of the knowledge of the Viking and Norse economy in Britain, and Ireland especially, was derived from historical sources, uh, so written records, 
and excavations at major urban centers such as Dublin and York, or Yorvik. These urban centers yielded vast amounts of knowledge on manufacturing and production, but unfortunately not very much information on agricultural economy. Um, obviously, animal bones and grains were found at these sites, but it wasn't very clear how they got there because, interestingly, in Ireland and England, there isn't a lot of evidence for rural settlement during the Viking and Late Norse period. Scotland is unique in that, although it exhibits no evidence for urban settlement, um, it does display a lot of evidence of agricultural activity and rural activity in the form of farmsteads, um, both newly built and reused from the earlier Pictish period. So things like wet sieving, palynology, and detailed sampling programs have really enhanced the way in which archaeologists can collect and analyze this ecofactual material from these rural settlement sites across the northern and western islands of Scotland. From the use of these techniques, it's become clear that livestock and grains were systematically farmed and there's also evidence that marine resources were also extensively exploited. Uh, there is some evidence for hunting land mammals, and this appears in the presence of animal bones like deer and roe, and also sites which were probably used as butchering sites for these animals. Because it wasn't very common for hunters to go out hunt the deer or whatever they were hunting and then bring it back whole to camp. It was actually a lot easier for them to break up the animal and then bring it back to the farm or to the camp or um, the homestead. Now I just want to quickly point out that the economy of Viking and Late North Scotland wasn't entirely dependent on agriculture um, and there's actually evidence for the production and exploitation of steatite vessels Steatite's a specific type of rock that is present in both Western Norway and Northern and Western Scotland that they shaped into bowls mostly and then used throughout Scotland um, and possibly exported back to Norway. There's also evidence for textile and linen production. Uh, comb manufacture is a big one and other sort of commodity based trades but it stands that in Scotland, agriculture was the main source of economic profit. This was true also of Western Norway and throughout uh, hopefully more of my podcast, you'll see that there's a really close link between Northern Scotland and Western Norway. And it's believed that it's from this region of Norway that the Vikings first came to Britain uh, by way of the Faroe Islands into the northern islands of Scotland, Orkney, Shetland, and then trickled down uh, into Ireland and the Western Isles. Now, the Vikings that you're seeing show up in the Danelaw in England are a completely different set of Vikings. They come from Denmark, and they're doing their own thing. So I guess a caveat uh, to include here would be that not all Vikings are the same especially in Britain, um, there are Vikings from both Norway and Denmark, possibly some from Sweden, although the Swedish Vikings expanded more eastward into Russia and along the Volga River. Okay, so first we're going to look at the maintenance and consumption of livestock, because generally speaking, it's the easiest to identify and it's the least affected by a lack of more advanced techniques like wet sieving, um, just because animal bones are usually pretty big uh, and easy to identify in the archaeological record. So I was mentioning earlier that Scotland shows a lot of evidence of farms, and this includes structural evidence of things such as fires. 
Um, this seems pretty obvious, but it actually reinforces the idea that cattle and other livestock were being raised and reared and overwintered indoors, which thus increased their lifespan. Um, so buyers are one of the structural markers that point towards livestock rearing in addition to the presence of animal bones in the records. Um, now, there's a site called Buck Roy in Orkney, and this site was actually a multi-phase settlement, which was first used by the Picts and then later used by Viking settlers. Now, the nature of how the Vikings came to be there, it's unclear. Maybe it was a violent takeover. Maybe the site was already abandoned by the time they arrived and they just decided to utilize the structure that was already there. We don't really know, and that's not really the focus of today's episode. So just needless to say, it's an interesting site because in addition to comparing structural elements across Pictish and Viking phases at Buckboy, you can also compare the percentages of animal bones in the different levels. So what you're seeing at Buckboy specifically is a relative distribution of about 50% cattle bones, 30% sheep, and 12% pig, leaving an 8% of other mammals. These other mammals were likely hunted as opposed to reared. Um, so they're things, you know, like the roe and the deer that I mentioned earlier. Now, those percentages are taken from late Norse levels, um, but they're concurrent with earlier Pictish levels as well suggesting that there wasn't too much deviation between the diets of Pictish people and Vikings. Um, there is a slight decrease in sheep for, across other sites between Pictish and Late Norse levels. Um, it's possible that the sheep populations were largely dependent on wild reproduction and this decline represents a natural reduction in wild sheep populations from the late Iron Age to the Viking Age. So it's not really clear whether this represents a cultural preference or simply a natural phenomenon. There's also evidence for an increase in cattle consumption at a site called Saver Howe. And it's possible that this is Again, either a cultural preference that the Vikings just preferred eating cow to sheep, or uh, it could be a result of the new farming methods brought to Scotland by the Vikings, which would be the buyers that I mentioned earlier, um, thus giving the cattle a longer lifespan and therefore more potential for breeding and reproduction. So generally speaking, the percentages of livestock from sites across Orkney don't show a substantial variation from Pictish to Viking periods, but there is some variation and that could be up to a number of factors. Evidence from another Viking settlement in Orkney called Koigru shows that the marrow was extracted from bones after they were butchered. And it also demonstrates that the there was a disposition towards younger animals when they were being killed. Um, this is likely because of dairying uh, and basically cows or sheep would be removed for access to the milk produced by the mother. So it's a bit sad, but they would kill the younger animal and then the mother would still produce milk, which would allow them to have not only milk, but also make cheese and butter, which were easily transportable commodities. There's also evidence to suggest that this shift towards dairying coincides with an increase in deep water fishing and sort of marks the progression from an early Viking Age subsistence economy whereby you just hunted and fished to feed your own family um, to a more advanced exchange program where easily portable commodities and storable products like butter, cheese, and salted and dried fish were used to pay rent or taxes or tithes and exchange for other commodities um, that they might have needed within the community. Sites such as the Brock of Bursay, Saberhow, Buckhoy, and Beachview 
show a relatively low number of these neonatal or young mammalian skeletons. And Jennifer Harland has proposed that this is because the areas or these sites were important political and religious centers and therefore potentially received dairy products as tithes from other farms. Ergo, there was no need to butcher animals young because they were getting their milk elsewhere. Um, this could also account for the marked increase in cattle bone percentages if the dairying cows were also being levied as tribute to the whole cow um, and not just the milk it produced. In addition to livestock being raised as food, um, wool remains preserved by the corrosion of metal objects, generally brooches, demonstrates the rearing of livestock for other economical purposes, such as linen production. Um, this in conjunction with the plethora of textile working tools found in graves, wool combs, spindle whorls, loom weights, weaving battens, weaving tablets, needles, needle cases, all of these are really commonplace. Um, items in Viking graves, it demonstrates the importance of wool and therefore sheep in the production of fabric as an additional commodity for production and exchange. Okay, so shifting away from mammals and towards fish, I think, uh, which are more commonly associated with Vikings, it appears that fishing began as a subsistence pursuit, um, generally offshore, small scale, uh, with evidence for the development of deep sea fishing on a commercial level into the late Norse period. Now, it's unclear whether this development took place because of the demands of a growing local population or more because of the pressures of taxation and trade we were talking about with the dairying earlier. Um, the artifacts associated with fishing are relatively few compared to the abundance of skeletal remains and fish bones. Line sinkers are the most common, but they are really hard to identify because they look basically just like a pebble with a hole in the middle. Uh, so in addition to being hard to identify from rocks, uh, they're also, when found, difficult to distinguish from stone beads or spindle whorls. Uh, Cape Ness is a site which demonstrates this massive commercial scale fishing activity because there are just so many fish bones there. It's unlikely that the amount of fishing taking place was just to feed a local population. Butchery marks from fish bones found at Koigru in Orkney suggest that dried cod was produced and exported, which aligns with this idea that such commodities were used as tribute tax to larger sites. Um, the skeletal remains of fish from houses represent smaller fish as opposed to cod, so it's possible that the larger cod were saved for commodity trading uh, or were valued higher and therefore used for tribute. Shellfish remains such as limpets and winkles, which are quite small, probably represent um, more of like bait for larger fish, but it's also possible that these shellfish were potentially more important to subsistence diets depending on the fertility of the soil and the size of the settlement. Um, unfortunately, this is difficult to prove because soil conditions have changed dramatically since the Viking Age. Um, so there's no way to be certain about that. So because the climate and soil conditions of the Viking and Late Norse period in the North Atlantic and specifically the Northern Isles of Scotland uh, were very different from modern times, it was probably a lot warmer and there was a lot more arable land available. Uh, therefore, crops like barley and oats represent the cereal grains most commonly cultivated in Orkney. And there's also evidence for the cultivation of flax, but this would have been used in linen production um, and not as part of the diet. So sites such as Tukhoi, Beachview, and Orphir have produced a lot of evidence for oats, um, while barley dominates uh, sites such as Bersay, 
and it suggested that oats could have been a weed crop in fields of barley. Um, this could potentially represent another example of superior crops being exported as tributes to high status sites. So if oats would have been a weed crop, they might not have been as highly regarded as barley, though still valued as an edible crop. A lot like what we were seeing with the disparity in fish bones, where the cod was exported to higher status sites and the fish eaten in the, in the homes were a lot smaller. Further evidence for grain processing comes from the discovery of a structural element at the Earl's Farm at Orphir, which has been determined to be the remains of a horizontal mill. So this would have been used for the mass production and processing of cereal grains, uh, potentially for export to religious sites. As I was saying earlier, there's also archaeological evidence for the cultivation of flax, and this mostly comes from the many known linen working implements found in the graves of women. And two great examples are glass linen smoothers and whalebone flax. Uh, but more commonly, you get objects such as sickles. Finally, we're going to touch on hunting a little bit, um, though it makes up a very small percentage of what the agricultural economy of Northern Scotland would have been in the Viking and late Norse periods, uh, it's still a really important thing to talk about. And actually most of our evidence for hunting at this time comes from Orkneyinga saga, uh, which makes mention of hunting grouse, hares, and deer. Uh, and it's possible that this activity was reserved as sport for the more elite members of society. Now, this theory is supported by the skeletal remains of these animals in a much smaller number than those of livestock, such as cattle and sheep. And kitchen refuse collected from the Brock of Versailles revealed bones of rabbit and otter. So given the presumed important status of the site, this sort of lends further support to this theory that hunting was an elite activity and not really used as much in the Viking and late Norse periods uh, to provide food. The proliferation of antler combs in the archaeological record suggests that deer hunting would have been a major sport, um, but actually several archaeologists have pointed out that antler can be collected from seasonal shedding and therefore doesn't necessitate, necessitate the hunting of the whole animal. Finally, a small, small, small percentage of marine bird bone has been found um, and suggests that the hunting of marine birds was uh, less a staple of this Viking diet and more used to augment a more consistent diet of cattle, sheep, pig, and fish. So, when assessing the agricultural economy of Viking and late North Scotland, it's really important to keep in mind the form of the structures as well as the ecofactual and archaeological assemblages themselves. Um, it's clear from research on the nature of Scandinavian settlement elsewhere in the UK and Ireland that the colonists were willing to be opportunistic and enterprising when it came to making a living. This is evidenced in the architectural expansion of sites such as Jarlshof, which suggests that the farmsteads were meant as permanent settlements, growing each year and expanding structurally to accommodate the needs of a growing family or community. Byers and barns in particular indicate the intention of long-term settlement and can be taken as evidence of the need to house livestock over many successive winters. Additionally, pagan Norse burials discovered across the northern and western isles solidify this idea of permanence and community, and often the grave goods associated with them can give hints to agricultural activity on a wide scale across a growing Scandinavian community in the north of Scotland. In conjunction with this idea of permanent settlement, there's also a lot of evidence to suggest a shift from subsistence farming in the early Viking period to a much larger commercial scale 
uh, agricultural economy in the later Norse period. So, so far I've presented you with a lot of statistics, a lot of potentially confusing information, a lot of site names, um, and just a lot of facts. But I want to take a minute to sort of tie it all together and really paint this broader picture of what settlement and life might have been like at this time. And I'm going to use examples from this podcast to sort of bring that to light. So imagine these structural elements like the buyers that have been identified at Jarlshof. And these really evoke images of humans and livestock huddled together under the same roof, probably keeping each other warm throughout what was likely a very harsh winter. You get these neonatal skeletons um, suggesting dairying, and you have these mills and the mass production of cereal and grains. And these all point towards a system of taxation and trade. So these were farmers who weren't only providing for their families, but who were also providing for a wider community um, and really working hard every single day to make sure that they paid their dues. You can really imagine them, you know, working very hard and very carefully to catch the cod and to prepare it just the right way and salt it and, um, you know, export it or to make the butter or to make the cheese and all of this effort that they would have gone to, not just for their own families, not just for personal gain, but really to embody a wider sense of community and culture, uh, which probably was really important in this new place where they were trying to settle down. You also see other occupations of Scandinavian settlers in industries like textile production, which are supported by the wool and the flax remains that we get uh, in the archaeological record. So especially connected to women, you're starting to see this image of what a female Scandinavian settler would have been doing, what she would have been like, the tools she would have had, you know, the spindle wools, the, the sickles. And the fact that these things were buried with them indicates the level of importance that these careers, that these industries had in the everyday lives of these people. Okay, so hopefully I've given you some small taste of what it might have been like to be a Viking settler in rural northern Scotland in the early medieval period. Um, it was probably a pretty tough life, but there was obviously a greater sense of community at play, and um, they were eating some pretty good stuff. <laughs> so thank you so much for tuning in. Uh, please send us any comments you may have. Uh, we'd love to hear from you guys. We'd love to hear any suggestions you might have for future topics or any suggestions you might have for future blog posts. We'd love to hear it all. And yeah, have a great day.